words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. I don't know if you watch YouTube at all. Um, I do. I, look, I watch all kinds of... Well, I call them wonderful. My wife calls them weird. Um, there's one in particular I watch that uh, has to do with naval history. Um, and it's um, the, the person who, who does it. Uh, the channel is called Rackenfell. Uh, Ruth says that that man has the most boring voice uh, in the world. And it will put you to sleep after five minutes. I don't agree. I find the stuff fascinating. Do you want to know what I learned um, the other day? Now, don't fall asleep. Um, I learned that there was, there was a, a part of a program about HMS Victory and that they're restoring it at the moment. They're taking away um, some of the, the outer planks that have rotted and uh, they're um, very carefully examining the, the structure that's underneath and they're going to put some, out, some new outer planks on. But what I learned as they were talking about it was that those outer planks, when they first built HMS Victory, those outer planks that keep the water out, so they're quite important, were designed to last nine years. That's it. They thought when they built HMS Victory, they would have to replace those outer planks after nine years. I, I don't know about you, but I was shocked by that. I mean, it, it's amazing that it's lasted so long, really. It was designed really with a, a shelf life of about about nine years before you had to do something with it. There are a lot of things that are built in our world to, to last a long time, but there are also a lot of things that are built to last a short time. There is the, the thought that goes around that modern day washing machines, fridges, and all the rest are built uh, to last just a short while and then be chucked away. You can't get the parts for it. They have to just be put away and you have to buy a, a brand new one that of course works so much better with all the whizzing lights and dials and, and all the things that you know you spend half an hour in a, in a book trying to understand some of the things in God's word that God talks about were designed to last for all eternity but some were designed to last for just a short while that's what this passage is talking about. This passage, the writer to the Hebrews, is talking about all the rituals, all the regulations that there were around the tabernacle and then the temple, where the sacrifices were made, where the priests went into the holy place, and then the holy of holy places once a year on the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. The Jews thought that these regulations, these things would go on forever. But the writer to the Hebrews knows that they were there just for a short while. They weren't the real thing. They were just copies of something that was happening in heaven. And that's what we're going to think about today. He talks about the tabernacle. He talks about describing the rooms and, and what's in them and then, and then says, but we can't discuss these things any further here. Isn't that funny? Do you ever get that when someone starts talking to you about something and then they go, but I can't talk about it now. And you think, oh, I was listening to that. I was quite interested in what they were going to talk about. But he doesn't. He's made his point. And the point he's going to make is that these things were just temporary. These things were there to cover over the sin of the people before Jesus came. And the key verse in that, in that part of the passage is to be found in, in verse 8. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. There was a place into which the people couldn't go. There was a place into which sinful people were, were forbidden to go. It was just the high priest. He had to make a sacrifice for his sins and for the sins of the people as he went in. It's interesting to note that actually that sacrifice he made for his own sins and sins of the people were for the sins that they knew nothing about. 
all the things that you remembered, all the things that you'd done that you knew about, you made a sacrifice for during the year. But this was a specific sacrifice for all the things you hadn't realized you'd done. You didn't have a clue about. And your sin was covered by the sacrifice that the high priest made. That no one else could go in. And of course what he's, what he's doing is he's, he's building up to the point of showing that actually Christ has gone into the Holy of Holies in heaven. And he's made a way for us to go into God's very presence. But for the, old, for the people of the Old Testament, it was no go. One of my favorite books, um, you know, it's very long, is Lord of the Rings. I remember reading it when I was very young. It had a very, very thick edition of very small writing. Um, I, could, I couldn't read it now. Um, but one of the, the phrases that is used towards the end of the book is this. The way is shut. It was made by those who are dead, and the dead keep it until the time comes. The way is shut. Those who were speaking to Ben Pelt, um, they could defeat the enemy. They were going through a mountain, and there they met the dead who died in dishonor. And, and the, the, the saying was that they were there until the new king would come and lead them uh, to defeat the enemy. And uh, in the film, it's a bit more dramatic than in the book, but in the film, the, uh, the king and his companions are met by these dead, by these ghosts who say they're going to kill them. And then they, they come to attack him and he holds up a sword. And they're shocked to find that there's his sword stopped in their sword. But they say, the way is shut. You are not going to come in. So it is with you and with me. Not just because of the sins that we know that we've committed, but because of all those things we do every day that we have no idea that we've done them. That was the way it was in the Old Testament. There was no way into the Holy of Holies. And the Holy Spirit was showing that by the, the things that the Old Testament people had to do and the, the high priest had to do, that there was a place into which the people of God could not go. The sacrifices and the gifts that were being offered weren't able to clear the conscience of the worshippers. They were able to make people, as it were, clean on the outside. They were able to cover sin, but they weren't able to get rid of sin. And as he said, they were just a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applying until the time of the new year. I've met Christians down through the years who, who won't eat certain things because uh, the regulations in the Old Testament say they shouldn't. Although inconsistent, I did know one man in Dereham who, who wouldn't eat black pudding because it contained blood. Well, there are all sorts of, I mean, I love black pudding, but there are all sorts of other reasons for, not, you know, not eating black pudding that you just don't like it. But, but he wouldn't eat it because the Old Testament says you shouldn't. But he still ate pork and he still ate seafood. And I used to say to him, but, but the Old Testament says you shouldn't eat blood, but it also says you shouldn't eat pork. It says you shouldn't eat seafood. And we used to get ourselves into knots when we had that. It, 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 was a, it was a playful argument, but it was an argument all the same. But we're not bound by the Old Testament regulations. We're not bound by the rules that say you should do this and you shouldn't do that. We're not bound by the things that are ceremonial and to do with um, sacrifice, because that time has gone. There were just external regulations. The way was shut into the Holy Place. But when Christ came, it says in verse 11, as the high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that's not made by human hands. When Christ came, he went into the holy place of the real holy place, the one in heaven. And there he offered sacrifice that not only covered our sins, but took them away. In fact, it says in verse 14, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may love his, God for loving him. The Old Testament, sin was covered for a while. The New Testament, sin is taken away. Our consciousness, I can't say that word. It's like when I was growing up, I couldn't say ambulance. 
and I, it, it was not something to do with just the, the way that the silver is rolled out. But our conscience, our consciences are, um, are cleansed in a way that the Old Testament and the rules and the regulations and the rituals couldn't cleanse our conscience. And why is that important? So that we may serve the living God. You see, the Old Testament people of God, it was about covering up your sin. It was about getting right with God. Once a year, the high priest going in and, and making sacrifice for all the things that you didn't realize that you'd done. And you left the priests to serve God. And the word that's actually used here is the word of the service of a priest. Our consciousness, well, our thoughts, I'll stop saying that, our thoughts and our hearts are, are cleansed from, from sin so that we may serve the living God. Serve in the way that the high priest did. Serve in the way in which we can go into the holy place and serve God as priests do. You know, sometimes uh, the church down through the years has put their priests, their ministers on a pedestal. That's never a good thing because um, you put your minister on a pedestal, he or she are going to lose their balance and fall off. Um, so don't, don't do it. But, but down through the years, it's been thought that, that only those who are ordained can, can serve God in a particular way. It's only those who have been specially set aside who can do certain things. Well, that's not something we, we hold to. At least that's not something we hold to officially as part of the Baptist Union or, or in free church. We still think about things that, you know, there's only certain people. Oh, no, the minister better do that. You know, if you want it done right, get the minister, well, maybe not right, but if you want it done right, get the minister to do it. But actually, no. Our hearts have been cleansed in a way that the Old Testament people's hearts have not been cleansed. We, don't, we do not have to depend on priests to get us close to God. We can all serve. God because he cleanses us on the inside as well as the outside. Spurgeon puts it like this. The kind of service here mentioned is not that which the slave or servant renders to his master, but a worshipful service such as priests render unto God. We that have been purged by Christ are to render to God the worship of a royal priesthood. We hear that it is ours to present prayers, thanksgiving, and thanks. The work of Christ on the cross is the real thing. The Old Testament rules and law regulations were meant just to be a shadow to, to remind us of what was to come in Christ. The Old Covenant, as, as, as the, the writer says, in the past, Moses said, the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you to keep. It was about keeping the rules. It was about keeping the regulations. It was about doing what you're told. And it was about making sacrifice when you failed in that. But the new covenant isn't like that. The new covenant, in the new covenant, everything has been done by Christ himself. Has cleansed us from sin. We need to live in the light of that cleansing. We need to live in the light of that forgiveness. Now, then, he does take some time to talk about a will, and that you don't, a will isn't put into effect um, unless you're dead, which I suppose is fairly obvious. But uh, uh, we're going to we're going to leave that that little bit um, because actually it's something we might need to come back to. Um, but what the, the end of the chapter tells us is that Christ didn't enter a sanctuary made with human hands, a copy of the true one. He entered into heaven itself and into God's presence. And it tells us that he doesn't do it again and again like the, the, the priest did in the Old Testament. He did it once and for all. Christ does not suffer many times. He suffered once. His work is done. His work is finished. 
he may or may not have been following the trial of, of someone else who was, was involved in a shooting in America, a man, a, an actor named Alex Baldwin. Um, he was on a, on a film set and um, somehow a live round got into the gun that he had and the gun went off and he shot someone. Um, he didn't load it, someone else did. Uh, well, he was put on trial for that. And unfortunately for the prosecution, they hid some of the evidence um, to do with that, that shooting, and they were found out. And this week, the trial was dismissed. And the judge, and I, I watched the, the judgment just to, to see what it was all about, it was dismissed with prejudice. Now, that's a term in the American um, legal system that means if, if a judge dismisses a case with prejudice, you can't come back and try it again. He has been declared not guilty in, in that sense. You can't, he can't be accused again. He walks free. So when Jesus came and paid the price for your sin and my sin, when he entered the holy place with the sacrifice that was himself and his own blood, the case against you and the case against me was dismissed with prejudice. The verdict has been announced and no one can do anything about it, including ourselves. So in the Old Testament, you brought your sacrifices. In the Old Testament, you depended on the high priest once a year to sacrifice for those sins that you did that you didn't know about. In the Old Testament, you had to obey in the Old Testament, you had to obey and follow these rules and regulations. But now, with this better sacrifice, the case that anyone could have against you and I has been dismissed. Do you know one of the most frustrating things I find is when someone I care about Whoever they might be, someone I know and care about, goes into a downward spiral over something they have done or said or thought, particularly if it is against me. Now, the, the truth is, I'm trying not to be sexist here, but being a man, sometimes I don't even notice when something says someone says something or does something against me. Um, I, I remember um, a long time ago, someone said of me when someone was apologizing for it upset if they'd upset me and, and someone else said oh you've got to try a lot harder than that uh, to insult <laughs> um, you know as I say maybe it's because I don't notice but when someone has done something or thinks they have and they won't accept my forgiveness my forgiveness when you say don't worry about it it's fine it's perfectly okay. And if you need forgiven, I forgive you. But still it comes in. Still there's anger. Still the relationship isn't quite right. Sometimes, as Christians, it can be like that with God, but it shouldn't be. Because as far as God's concerned, as far as God's concerned, he's forgiven. As far as God's concerned, he has moved on. Not because he's careless. Not because um, he doesn't think about these things. But because of the death of Christ, his son, on the cross. The case against us has been dismissed with prejudice. No longer is the way shut. The way is open. No longer is the way closed. It is there to be walked through into his very presence. And one day Christ will return, not to bear sin, for there is no more sin to bear, but to bring salvation. That is what he will come to say. Today, if you feel that the way is shut, God, open your eyes and see it isn't. 
for your salvation doesn't depend on rules and regulations and ceremonial washings. It depends on what Jesus has done, how much more he has done than happened in the Old Testament when he died once for all. And yes, that includes you. That includes me. Let's live on. Father, help us to live in the light of what Jesus, your son, has done for us. Help us to leave behind the rituals and rules and regulations of religion that would so easily bind us. Help us to know how much more you have done through Jesus, your son. Help us to know in all its reality that the case against those who follow Christ has been dismissed for all time.